All right, welcome to our uh, Thursday evening New York Giants Preservation Society. Today we have just a great event scheduled with Jim Hirsch, the author of Willie Mays, The Life, The Legend. Uh, tomorrow is Willie's birthday. He'll be 91. And I thought it was appropriate to tie him into somebody with superior knowledge of Willie. And hold on, somebody needs to mute. Can we please mute? All right. Anyway, uh, well, I'll, I'll, as soon as I'm done talking, I will get it. here we go. All right. Um, Jim Hirsch, uh, who wrote this book, many of us got autographed copies during the 2011 uh, Giant Trophy Tour in Manhattan. And it's just a fabulous book. So we're going to introduce Jim in a, in a couple of minutes. Just want to tie up some other business. Next week, uh, we're going to have an author, Peter Karasotis, who will be discussing his book on Felipe Alou. Uh, Felipe Alou turns 87 next Thursday. Peter will be addressing us on Wednesday. He cannot make it on Thursday, so it will be a Wednesday uh, um, meeting. Giants play 345. Hopefully, they'll be done, um, you know, by 705. Last time I did that, they were done, you know, at 630. So hopefully, we'll, uh, we'll take care of that. Uh, but again, tonight, uh, we're going to celebrate the life of, of uh, Willie Mays, and it is our distinct privilege to welcome Jim Hirsch to the New York Giants Preservation Society for tonight's Zoom meeting. Jim, thank you so much for uh, coming aboard tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Uh, I appreciate the invitation. It's always a pleasure to talk with anyone with connections to the New York Giants. So I'll, I'll talk for a while and then take your questions. And I, I guess I'll, um, I'll just begin by explaining how I, I, I got involved with this book. Um, <clears throat> My first book came out in 2000. It was a biography of Reuben Hurricane Carter. And I gave a presentation about Reuben. Afterwards, a gentleman approached me and said, you know, the person you should really write about is Willie Mays. Because there were certain similarities between Reuben's story and Willie's story, the same era and just sort of the nexus of race and sports in American life. As it happens, I, I was and am a huge baseball fan. Uh, I grew up in St. Louis. I was a, and am a huge Cardinal fan. I never saw Willie play, but of course I knew all about Willie um, as a player. And what immediately intrigued me about Willie was that in addition to what he did on the field was that his career in major leagues spanned from 1951 to 1973. Um, yeah, which is, um, which is essentially uh, overlaps the modern civil rights movement in, in America. So I thought that act, that would serve as an interesting backdrop and, and framework here, one of the most prominent black men in America. Um, you know, what, what was his life during this time in American history? My problem was that I didn't have any contacts in Major League Baseball. I had no way of reaching Willie. So I got hold of a documentary that ESPN had recently done, uh, it, was, it was a one hour documentary that had a lot of interviews with various luminaries and talking heads from the baseball world. And um, including an interview with an older gentleman by the name of Cy Berger, who seemed to know Willie very well on a, on a personal level. So I, I looked Cy up online and found that he was um, an executive and a baseball card company, and he first met Willie in the early 1950s uh, to sign Willie up for his, his first baseball card, and he became a friend and advisor of Willie's ever since. So I next had to find Cy. I thought, I thought maybe he could introduce me to Willie. So, I, um, so I, I, I called the company that Cy worked at. He was retired, but they gave me his home phone number. I don't think companies would do that now, but even in 2000, it was, it was kind of a a different uh, era then. So I called Cy, he, he lives on Long Island, 
and I introduced myself and I said, I wanted to write a book about Willie Mays. And he thought it was a great idea. He said, there has never been a book written about Willie. There needs to be one. He told me all the reasons why I should do it. But he said there was a problem, which is that Willie doesn't like doing these kinds of projects. Um, he, he doesn't trust people. He doesn't really like to open up to people. It'll be very difficult to, to pull this off. But he said to me, Jimmy, here's what you can do. I'm going to see Willie next month at the Hall of Fame ceremony in Cooperstown. Why don't you write me a letter and tell me why you want to do this book? I will give it to Willie in, in Cooperstown and I'll see what he says. So I wrote Cy a, a letter, I mailed it to him. And he, he goes to Cooperstown, he sees Willie, he comes back, Cy calls me up and says, sorry, Willie's not interested. So fine, um, I write another book and that takes two years. Now it's 2002 and I said, well, you know, I'm gonna try to, try to meet Willie again. I'm gonna try to do this again. So I call Cy back up, I still have his phone number. I say, hey Cy, this is Jim Hirsch, I'm still interested. Cy tells me all the reasons why it's a great idea. He wants to help me. He saw all the reasons why it's going to be, be hard to do. But he says, Jim, this is what I want you to do. I'm going to see Willie next month in Cooperstown at the Hall of Fame ceremony. Write me a letter, and I'll, I'll, I'll take it to, to Willie, and I'll see what he says. So I still got my letter from two years ago on my computer. So I update it. I mail it to Cy in, in Long Island. He takes it to Willie. Cooperstown, he comes back. Cy calls me, says, sorry, Willie's not interested. Okay. I write another book. Two more years pass. Now it's 2004. And I'm not making this story up. It's 2004. I said, I'm going to try one more time. So I call Cy. I say, Cy, it's still Jim Hirsch. I'm still interested in this, in, in talking to, to Willie for a book. We go through the same thing. He says, Jim, send me a letter. I'm going to see Willie next month. We go through the same thing. Cy sees Willie, comes back, calls me up and says, sorry, Willie's not interested. I figure, finally, OK three strikes and you're out. This isn't going to work. I, I did all I could. I write another book. Now it's January of 2007. And my, it was actually my agent who persuaded me, she, you should try really one more time. And I figured, you know, this isn't going to work, but he persuades me. Now, I don't even know at this point if Cy is dead or alive. I mean, he was like in his 70s when I first met him. But I, I call him up. I actually talked to his wife. And his wife says, Jim, we're so glad to hear from you again, like I'm part of the family now, you know, because I've been calling for so many years. Um, I talked to Cy, Cy says, okay, I'll, I'll give Willie a call and, you know, and I'll see if this works. Cy calls me back two weeks later and says, Willie will talk to you. And he gives me Willie's phone number. I've been trying seven years to get this number. I finally get it. And uh, so I call Willie and the, but the, the line is disconnected. I call again, it's, it's disconnected. So I call Cy back up and I say, Cy, I think, I think you gave me the wrong number. Can you, can you double check? Now Cy's in his 80s now, so his, his eyesight isn't as good. Originally, the, the number he gave me, the last four digits were 2422, two, two, but the correct digits were 2424. 2424, four. Willie convinced the phone company that um, you know, he, he wanted the, those, those digits to be his phone number. And as I was later to discover, everything Willie did had 24 involved. His license plate was 24. He has all kinds of memorabilia with 24. Oz! That's- Come here. That's he. Hello? Yeah, you're good. That, so okay, that's his, that's his identity. So I, I call Willie up and I introduce myself. He says, oh yeah, can you, you can come on by. Willie starts giving me directions to his house. He doesn't realize. He's in Atherton, California, in the same house that he's lived in since he, he bought it in 1968. He doesn't realize that I live in Boston, but he's giving me directions to how to get to his house <laughs> from the highway. And, um, and so I take down the information and I'm literally on, on the plane the next day and I'm in his home two days later. Um, about that first visit, the only thing I'll mention really is just what strikes you when you meet Willie, and I'm sure some of you have, he has the largest hands and forearms you've ever seen. You know, Willie was 5'10 and 160 pounds. He wasn't a big guy. But when you meet Willie and you shake his hands, you realize the source of his power was unbelievable strength okay, in his forearms and his hands. And so um, that began the, 
journey. And it, it still took a long time to, um, to convince really to, to agree to do the book and, you know, it, it, but, but that was how, how we started. Um, I, I should mention that the, the arrangement that we had from the outset was that I had editorial control of the book, but I would let him read the manuscript and he could make any factual corrections or if he thought I got something wrong. But that's, that's what an authorized bi biography was as we, as we defined it. And, um, and, it, and again, it began this journey where I got a chance to interview all kinds of remarkable people outside of baseball, people like Bill Clinton and Woody Allen and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar to people inside baseball, such as Koufax and Seaver and Aaron and Monty Irvin. One night, um, the, the phone rang and my wife, Cheryl, picked it up and she says, hello, she says, hold on, I'll see. And she calls to me, she says, hey, Jim, some guy named Gaylord Perry wants to talk to you. You want to talk to him? I said, yeah, I'll, I'll talk to Gaylord. And, and so I got a chance to talk to you know, just a lot of great people and great players, many of whom all of you know very well. Um, so I'll, I'll just talk about a couple of different aspects of Willie's life for the, for the purpose of this conversation. Um, I want to talk about Willie's childhood. You know, millions of words literally have been written about Willie. And, He's been in many, many books. And of course, countless magazine articles, newspaper articles, documentaries, et cetera. Relatively little has ever been written about Willie's childhood. And needless to say, you know, not just Willie, but for all of us, you know, our childhood is our foundation, no matter who, no matter who you are. And so if you really want to understand someone, you know, that's where you have to start. And there's one aspect of Willie's childhood that I, I, I want to talk about. As, as I'm sure some of you know, Willie was born and raised in Alabama, specifically initially Westfield, Alabama, a little steel town outside of, um, uh, of Birmingham and then Fairfield, another small town um, outside of, uh, of, of Birmingham. Um, but the person I wanna focus on is Willie's mom. So Willie, of course, as, as you know, was born in 1931, uh, 91 years ago. His mother was a 16-year-old high school teenager, and uh, she, she was a, a track star. She could run like the wind. Her, her name was Annie Satterwhite. Willie's father was 19 years old. His name was Cat Mays. Cat worked in the steel mills. He played semi-pro baseball. He later was a porter on, 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 the, on the, the Pullman trains. Um, his, Willie's parents were not married. And um, when Willie was born, Willie's mother, Annie, didn't think she could uh, take care of, of, of Willie. So she gave Willie up to her two younger sisters, 13-year-old Sarah and 11-year-old Ernestine. So Willie was mostly raised by these, these two aunts of his who themselves were barely teenagers. Um, Willie's father, Kat, was, was always present, was always in the picture. But he traveled a lot and didn't necessarily um, live in the household. Now, for us nowadays, you're looking at that, that's kind of an unconventional way for a kid to be raised. Um, but in that community, there were a lot of complicated family structures. And again, and in that community as well, um, kind of all the adults raised the kids. You know, we're talking about a, a segregated, low income com community in rural Alabama. Um, so Willie's, and, and Willie's aunt Sarah was really the principal adult in, in, in Willie's life. Um, but Willie was always in touch with his mom, Annie. Annie, after high school, she married another man, not Willie's father, but she married another man and, and settled in a, in a community about five miles away. And she had 10 children with her husband. And when Willie was growing up, Willie used to take his bike and go over and see his, his mom. But he, it was complicated because he would go take his bike there and sometimes he'd go by himself, sometimes he'd go with a friend. And his mom was really busy because his mom had 10 children that she was raising. And Willie was there on the outside and Willie was trying to get the attention of Willie's mom who was obviously very distracted. And when you think about Willie Mays, the baseball player, 
one thing that comes to mind was that he was visually the most arresting figure who ever played baseball. You couldn't take your eyes off of him. And it was very intentional. He played with a charisma and flair and style that was unmatched. The way he ran, the way he threw the ball, the basket catch, um, uh, just his, his the, just the, 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 the dynamism that he played with. And whenever Willie was asked about that kind of, you know, the, the, the flair and the style that he played with, he would talk about his years playing in the, in the old Negro leagues. As, as many of you know, he played for the Birmingham Black Barons. And in the Negro leagues, they were competitive. They played to win, but they also played to entertain the fans. That was central to their mission. Um, uh, you know, the, 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 the fans would, they, they'd go to church on Sunday morning, they would take their picnic baskets, and then they'd go to, to the baseball game. And the players did things on the field to, to make it as entertaining as possible. And that's, and, and Willie imported that style of play to the major leagues, and did, did, did Jackie Robinson and some of the other players who, who, who came over from the Negro Leagues. But beyond that, I think what really influenced Willie's style of play was this dynamic with his family and with his mom in particular. And I should note that this insight came not from anything that Willie told me, but I, I went to Birmingham and I found people that Willie grew up with, friends and family members. And they were the ones who told me about this relationship that Willie had with his mom. And I was, and then I was confident that I knew that his mom played this role in Willie's life. And I should say, I don't psychoanalyze people I, I write about, but I do try to understand that. Um, Willie as an adult has as his password on his computer, Annie, A-N-N-I-E, the first name of his mother. So that's how I knew that that, that part of Willie's life played such a, an important role. And I think you can, you can draw a line from Willie standing outside his mother's home with his, with all of his um, half siblings in the house, trying to get attention, draw a straight line from that all the way to um, Willie Mays playing center field in the polo grounds. Um, so um, next I wanna talk a little bit about Willie Mays, the baseball player. Um, you know, to me, it wasn't a matter of was Willie Mays, the greatest player of all time or not. It was, Willie Mays was a completely new archetype in Major League Baseball. When, when Willie came into the league in 1951, there were considered basically two types of players. There was the slugger who hit home runs and RBIs, and there was the, the, the player who was fast, who would bunt, who would steal a lot of bases and, and, and hit for a, for a high average. So you had like, you know, Babe Ruth was sort of one prototype and Ty Cobb was the other prototype. Yeah. And then you, 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 know, you had some very good, well, you had some great all around players like DiMaggio and Musial and Williams. And then soon to come guys like Mantle and Aaron and Clemente. Um, but when Willie came along, there had never been a five tool player before. That phrase did not exist before Willie came along. Someone could hit for average, home runs, steal bases, throw, and, 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 was, and, and hit, hit for average. So Willie literally redefined the game of baseball. And to me, that was what, um, is what you know, made him such a, a compelling figure to, to write about. Now, when people talk about the greatness of a player, particularly in baseball, they, they typically focus on the numbers and you know uh, Gary sent out an email that had some of the the, the, the data points of Willie's career you know the 302 batting average and the 660 home runs and the 941 OPS and all the rest um, and but I, I'm not really interested in those kinds of numbers but there, there are kind of a few quirky numbers or, or, or less well-known numbers that I'm interested one is his his put outs in center field um, Willie is the all-time leader in putouts for an outfielder, 7,095. No other outfielder has broken 7,000, and no other outfielder will. Um, right now, uh, among current players, the leader is Mike Trout. Um, he's played for 12 years. He barely has 3,000 
putouts. Willie is more than 4,000 putouts ahead of Trout. And, and tr someone like Trout will never get close to Willie because um, in, in the way the game has evolved, first of all, players don't play 162 games anymore. They, they get rested. And with the, the DH, everyday players now get, you know, half days off by, by playing, by, by, by not taking the field. And so, um, so to me, you know, that's an extraordinary number. I, I read a, a story once by, by that, in which a reporter observed about Willie, said Willie Mays never had to dive for a baseball. And, I, and in my conversations with Willie, I said, well, Willie, why did you never have to dive for a baseball? And he said, because I didn't have to. I said, okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Another number that I, I like of, of Willie's is that he's the only player in the history of baseball to hit a home run in at least one home run every inning from one to inning 16. Yeah, I, I like that data point because it speaks to Willie's longevity and his durability and the fact that he, he came up big in clutch situations. And of course, the way the game has evolved now with putting a runner on at second base, um, you know, at the 10th inning, no, no player is ever going to hit a, a home run in every inning from, from, from one through, through 16. All that being said, what, what made Willie to me such a great player was the stuff that you couldn't calculate in a box score. You, you couldn't um, quantify, I should say. Now, it's true for every great player in any sport. They do things that do not show up in the box score or in, you know, the football stats or the hockey stats, whatever. But with Willie, it was, it was so much more. The way in which, um, again, he, he did things that couldn't be calculated. There were things like, you know, he, he would score from first base on a hit and run single because and when he was rounding third, he would always notice if the relay man would drop his arm before he was going to throw home. And Willie would, would take advantage of that and score. Willie, on a close play at home plate, he would slow down and, and so that he would arrive at home plate the same time the ball would arrive so he could slam into the catcher, jar the, bar, the ball loose, allowing the trailing runner to advance one base. Again, something that could not be calculated in a box score. Um, one of my favorite plays of, of Willie's, it was bottom of the 10th inning one game. They were playing the Mets, like this was the late 60s. Score tied, Willie's on second base. There's, there, there's one out. There's a ground ball to the third baseman, Wayne Garrett. If, if Willie just runs hard, he reaches third base and Garrett throws the runner out and first base, and Willie's at third with two outs. Instead, Willie slows down. Wayne Garrett sees Willie slow down. He thinks he can tag Willie out before he gets to third. So instead of getting the sure out at first, Willie accelerates. He evades Garrett's tag. He reaches third base safely. First and third one out. The next batter hits a fly ball to right field. Willie scores the, the game winning run on a sacrifice fly. That doesn't appear in a box score, but it, it shows you the way Willie did things that, that no one else did. And finally, on, on this topic, I'll share with you my, my story about, about Tom Seaver. I think I referenced this in an essay that I wrote for the Times last year. Um, but I, I saw Seaver and his uh, home in Napa Valley. Seaver um, uh, uh, made, made wine, and he was very proud of his southern exposure for his, for his, his, his grapes. And so I, I spent an afternoon with Seaver and his beautiful wife, Nancy. Um, Seaver loved Willie. Uh, he, he was a, he was a, he idolized Willie when he was growing up. When Seaver played college bas uh, baseball, he unbuttoned the top button on his shirt because that's what Willie did when, when um, Willie played. And finally in 1972, Willie is traded to the Mets with, with Seaver. And the first game that Seaver pitches, uh, and Willie's playing center field, Willie approaches Seaver before the game, and he's got the opposing team's lineup in his, in his hand. And he says to Tom, okay, I, I want to go over each player in the lineup. You tell me how you're going to pitch each player, and I'll adjust 
where I, I position myself accordingly. And so Seaver did that. And then Seaver and Willie um, developed these signals where Seaver would discreetly uh, tell Willie out in center field how he was going to adjust pitching a particular player so Willie could reposition himself accordingly. Now, keep in mind, this is long before they had all the computer graphic scouting reports that they have now. I'm sure they had scouting reports, but, but not what they, what, they had, um, what they have right now. Um, but what, what was amazing and what, what Seaver wanted to emphasize to me was that he, Seaver was in the major leagues for 20 plus years. The only position player who ever approached him in that 20 years about how he was going to pitch the opposing players was Willie Mays. And what Seaver said was that, you know, um, yes, Willie had supernatural physical abilities, running, his strength and his agility. But what separated Willie from everyone else was his preparation and his <coughs> baseball IQ. And, you know, that, that was the thing that no one really appreciated. Uh, <coughs> And when I when I, I spoke to Willie about this, I said, I, you know, I know some players would keep a journal about how hitters would hit or how you know pitchers would pitch. And I asked Willie, you know, like like how, how did you remember the tendencies of all of all the opponents? Did you keep a journal? He said, No, I kept it all right here. And uh, to again to emphasize just his 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 baseball IQ. Um, I also want to talk briefly about something that I, I referenced at the outside. At the outset, Willie Mays as a figure in the civil rights movement. Um, Willie uh, received a lot of criticism when he was playing, specifically from Jackie Robinson, for not being more outspoken uh, about the, the movement. Remember, this is the 1960s, and people are in the streets protesting, and, and you have very prominent Black athletes, Muhammad Ali, Bill Russell, Jackie Robinson, and, and others who are trying to advance civil rights for Black Americans. Willie didn't say anything. And, and Jackie in particular was very critical of Willie and that had to hurt Willie. Um, but what those individuals didn't understand, those critics didn't understand was that whereas Jackie grew up in California and went to UCLA, Willie was a product of the deep South. He grew up in Alabama in the 1930s and 40s. And what Willie was taught in a very young age was that you as a young black boy and then soon to be a young black man, if you say the wrong thing, if you do the wrong thing, or even if you look at someone the wrong way, this is what's gonna to happen to you. You're either gonna be arrested, you're gonna be incarcerated, you're gonna be lynched, or your house is gonna be bombed. And so those were the lessons of Willie's youth. He always believed that if he said something, the, if he said something wrong, or if he created any controversy whatsoever, this would be the outcome for him. So he couldn't say anything because that's um, that, that, that was that was how he, how he was raised. Uh, some of I'm sure many of you know the story, even just the the, the headline of what happened to Willie when the Giants moved from New York to San Francisco in 1958, Willie was the crown jewel of MLB's expansion to California. So Willie gets out there, they throw parades for Willie and, and for all the Giants when, when they arrive. But then when Willie tries to buy a home, the builder won't sell him the home because he's, he's black. Um, this becomes a huge story, not just out in California, but around the country. Uh, it becomes a huge embarrassment to San Francisco, which supposedly was this haven for inclusivity and progressive thought, but they won't sell Willie his home. So the builder capitulates and agrees to, to, to sell Willie, Willie the home. Although what isn't known, unless they read it in my book, is that um, the, the, the realtor who represented the builder refused to take his fee of about $1,200 uh, because he would not take money from a black man because he thought that that would ruin his business as a realtor. Subsequent to Willie uh, and his wife moving into their home, uh, about you know, some months later, somebody throws a, uh, a 
of the Coke bottle and into the, into the front window of Willie's home with a racist epithet inside the, the bottle. Now, Willie's wife, his first wife, Marguerite, was very bitter and upset about this and spoke out about this to the press. Willie never said anything, never complained when people asked about him then or asked him about it then or when I asked him about it. You know, Willie would just say, well, you know, that's the way it is. It's unfortunate. But Willie couldn't complain because of, of how he was raised. And I was uh, researching the book. You know, I, I interviewed people like Joe Morgan and, and Dusty Baker, people who were his, not quite his contemporaries, but because they, but, they were a bit younger, but people who experienced the, the same thing that Willie did and who knew Willie very well. And they really wanted me to understand how many razor blades. Willie had to swallow in order to be Willie Mays in that, in, that, in, in, in that era. Other black players did as well, of course, I mean, most famously Hank Aaron, but, um, but that's something that you, know, you really have to appreciate Willie, about what Willie had to overcome to be Willie Mays. But all that notwithstanding, I think Willie was a really important figure in the civil rights movement. And here I draw upon my, some of my own experiences. I grew up in a, uh, an all white suburb of St. Louis in the 1960s and 70s. But I was a huge sports fan. My, my heroes growing up were black athletes of the era, some of whom you're familiar with like Lou Brock and Bob Gibson. My parents never you know, lectured me and my siblings about civil rights or about treating black people equally or anything like that. They didn't read Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail, they didn't have to. When I first learned about something called racism, it wasn't like I was indignant about it. I just, I couldn't, I was just puzzled by it. How could anyone not like black people? They were the best players. And it was, it was the, the black athletes that really sort of indoctrinated, you know, white kids like me to realizing that black people are cool and we should emulate them. And so I knew that really had that effect on many white people, perhaps people on this call. Um, and so I started, I started doing some research about this and, and, and interviewing people. Um, in, in 1954, Willie was on the cover of Sports Illustrated with Leo DeRocher and Leo DeRocher's wife, the actress Lorraine Day. For whatever reason, Lorraine Day decided to put her arm around Willie Mays for the picture. And on the cover of Sports Illustrated, you had a white woman touching a black man, violating the ultimate tenor in American society. It created an uproar with Sports Illustrated. They were deluged with hundreds of letters, people canceling their subscriptions. America was going to hell in the handbasket. And yet it was an important milestone in the civil rights movement because you actually had this breakthrough. Um, I, I, I spoke to Bill Clinton. Clinton is, is a friend of, of Willie's. They played golf together in the 1990s. But I didn't care about Clinton's friendship with Willie. What I want to talk to Clinton about was what it was like growing up in Arkansas in the 1950s and what impact Willie had. And as soon as I asked Clinton about it, he immediately understood what I was getting at. Um, and, and he told me about how, you know, uh, during the week, uh, Bill Clinton would spend his days with other kids and other adults who would fight tooth and nail to preserve Jim Crow in the South. But on Saturday, they'd go home and cheer for Willie Mays on Saturday afternoon baseball. And so even just subconsciously, Willie had a huge in, impact on white Southerners. Uh, I, I read a, a column from a, a guy in San Francisco who shared the, the, the story about how um, uh, he was in Texas and there was this kid and watching a Little League game and there was a kid in center field. His grandfather was the wizard of the Ku Klux Klan back in the day, but this boy out in center field running around saying, look at me, look at me, I'm Willie Mays. So that was the influence that Willie had. And I think it was a profound influence that he had on, in, the, in the civil rights era. And, I, and one of the things I hoped to have done in the book was to sort of correct that misimpression. All that said, I'll, I'll share this final story um, 
about a conversation that I had with, with Willie a, a few years ago. So I'll call Willie on the phone occasionally just, just, just to chat with him. I called him several years ago. It happened to be during the, uh, the World Series between the Chicago Cubs and the, Chicago, and the Cleveland Indians, as they were known at that time. And so I'm just making small talk with, with Willie. And so I say, so Willie, who are you rooting for in the World Series? And Willie says, oh no, I can't say. I, I, don't, wanna, I don't wanna get in trouble. I don't wanna say anything like that. Even Willie now in his 80s, he's fearful that if he tells me who he's rooting for in the World Series, if they were to get out, he would somehow offend the fans of that other team and all the goodwill that Willie Mays had built up over, over a lifetime would be gone. Now, as it is, I, I knew who Willie was rooting for. He's rooting for the Cubs because he's a national leaguer. But it just showed that even in the, in the twilight of his life, Willie still walked in the shadows of his youth. And I, I went away from that conversation and, and really from many things about Willie, feeling like kind of a, a heavy heart. You know, there was a lot of poignancy that um, Willie still feared that, that he as a black man in America would always, was always at risk, was always vulnerable um, to being put down a few notches. Um, and so finally, I'll just mention um, that in just in preparing for this, for this conversation, um, uh, I was paging through the book and I, I, I don't know how many people I, I interviewed, it was well over a hundred people, um, but a, a lot of those people have died since I, whom, whom I spoke to. Um, people whom, who people in this call know, like, like Tom Seaver and McCovey and Monty Irvin, who by the way should have been the Jackie Robinson, that's a whole other story. Um, Dusty Rhodes, I'm sure people in this call know, Dusty's a great guy and I, I interviewed him, ended up being a good left-handed hitter. He hit the game-winning home run in the first game of the 1954 World Series. Um, not the best athlete in, in the world. And, and, and he, he said to me, you know, Jim, people used to ask me, what position do you play? And I say, me and Willie played left field because <laughs> Willie would take all the fly balls that went in the left field. <laughs> well, unfortunately, Dusty, you know, has, has passed away. Um, a, a, a gentleman whom you would have never heard of, his name is Sam Sirkus, S-I-R-K-U-S. -S um, he got to know Willie very well during Willie's years with the New York Mets. He was like a friend and agent. And I, I met Sam out on Cape Cod where he lived. Sam had kept a journal of Willie's years when he was with the Mets. And there's a whole fascinating story that chapter of Willie's life dealing with the owner and the front office and the manager, um, which is a really sort of rich and, and nuanced um, part of Willie's life, which had never been told before. And I only got to know it because Sam gave me this journal of his and, and spent time with me literally six weeks after I met Sam, he died. He was like, you know, he was in his late 60s, he was a young man. And, and thinking about this book now, and, and you know, which came out in 2010, and thinking about you know just my experience with it, and the the, the years that I spent trying to get Willie's number, but I now understand those seven years, the window was closing. You know, if I tried to do this book now, it'd be a fraction of the book that I, that I wrote because so many of the people who shared so much of their stories with me about Willie. Um, those, 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 those people are gone. And I, so I feel really fortunate that I was able to do the book when I did, because I'm sure other people will write books about Willie down the road, but no one will have the opportunity that, that I had. It was really a blessing that I was able to, to connect with so many people um, who, um, who, who we have since lost. And, I, and again, just going through through the, 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 the book today, I got, I mean, I got kind of misty eyed because we've, we've lost so many. Um, so, um, so on, on, but, but we haven't lost Willie and that's the blessing. 
And so, um, so in fact, I've, I've rambled now for a long time, probably too long, I apologize. So let me open up for questions and if, and if I can answer any, I'll, I'll be happy to do so. Jim, that was uh, fabulous. Thank you so much. And for those who don't have this great book, uh, Jim, what, where is the best way to get the book? If uh, um, Probably uh, Amazon. Okay. Makes a no, great I'm, Father's I'm, Day gift for yeah. those who don't have it. Um, just a couple of comments. I think this group, mo most of the people who are in this group because of Willie Mays. I, I, I think it would be hard. Not, I mean, everybody loves the New York Giants, but Mays, such a part of uh, our lives, a part of our uh, parents' lives and, and, and the like. Um, Jim, one thing, uh, when they brought in the trophy, none of us believed the Giants would, I think, ever win a world championship in San Francisco. Your book truly, besides being amazing, was you know the icing on the cake. When Mays came in and you said about his youth, Nobody saw him as an 80-year-old guy coming in. They saw him as a 25-year-old guy with his hat flying off. And to sit down with him and for him to scribble his name in the book, I mean, that must have made you feel wonderful uh, that they were signing a fabulous book and their idol and hero was the guy who's there signing it. How do you feel about that? Um, you know, to me, it's just kind of, Grat a mixture of gratitude and, um, and, and, and appreciation, not only for um, Willie and, and going and, and it, you know, it's not easy for him to sign books at this age, as I'm, I'm sure you can appreciate, but, you know, it, it's, and just the power of the, your group and just the power of baseball, that how it brings people together and it forms community. I mean, um, uh, you know, speaking as, as someone who loves baseball and will always love it, and and um, and, and the fact that you know your group uh, has you know it's it's it creates such tremendous bonds and friendships and and then you had the championship and then you had your hero show up and Willie obviously is so grateful um, that people care about him. I mean, yeah, I just it's it's a really great feeling. That's great. One last comment. Um, I know all of us hate seeing the Giants. Most of us who are in here are Giant fans, and we hate seeing them lose. But I was at the first game that Mays played as a Met, and it was okay that the Giants lost that day. So, uh, <laughs> Artie, you are up. You say me, Gary? Yes, I did. I got to tell you, that book is magnificent, superb, stupendous. When it first came out, I don't I must have read the review in the Times and I got the book faster than anything. I actually went to a Barnes and Noble to pick it up. I, I wasn't waiting for Amazon and I devoured it. And then the Giants won the World Series and they gave out the book and I roamed around taking photographs. I hope Gary sent you a photograph that I took of Willie signing the book. I got down so I was eye level with him yeah. and I could see those magnificent hands as he was signing the book, as he was autographing the book. And he sat there patiently. Gary, help me out. Were there about a hundred people in that room? And he signed the book for everybody. That's, uh, I think there was more than a hundred. Oh, good, good, thanks. Cause I was photographing. And I got when I got up there, I mean, I, I just wanted him to sign, but I couldn't help but saying to him that Willie, I had read the book and that he I said, Willie, you're truly a an important person in the, in the history of this country. And Willie turned to me and he said, how kind of you to say that in this wonderful voice. So soft. Um, I'm not going to hog anything, but I want to tell you the first time I saw Willie play. I was two months shy of nine years old. It was July 10th, 1954. Willie was in center field. He made a great catch in right center, whirled and threw a runner out at home plate. He stole home, although the, if you find the 
the uh, box score from that day, it'll say that Willie scored on an error on the pitcher. No, no, he didn't. It was a steal of home. I'm telling you that. That's how my father scored it in his book. And interestingly, you talk about Willie's effect on the civil rights movement. Before I forget it, you, you, you define something else. Yes, Willie was the first five-tool player, but we in this group have decided that Willie is really a six-tool player, and he has that six-tool. Absolutely. But we sat, my dad, my brother, and I sat in a section of the polo grounds in right field. I think it was a dollar thirty to sit in those seats, and and the pe- the people mostly were black people. I believe they were called Negroes in those days. I don't think they coined the term African American. And I look back on it, they had a distinctly Southern sound to their voice, and how they worship Willie Mays. That's how I know Willie stole home, because one of the people cheering kept screaming. Steal home, Willie. Steal home. He did. <laughs> That's how I know that was a steal of home. Uh, I can go on forever, but Gary will shut me down. But I'll tell you, your book was wonderful. You And, and this talk, this is, you got it. Willie Mays was an, a, a, an important figure. He still is an important figure. I saw him make plays with his brain. One last story, Gary, I promise. It was around 1967. My brother and I were sitting. It was a midweek game against the Mets. There maybe were 15, 20,000 people in the yard, so you could hear what was going on. Willie didn't have a good day at the plate. I think he struck out three times. But late in the game, Gaylord Perry had come in relief over Mike McCormick. Mike McCormick, who won the Cy Young that year in the National League, was a, we used to call it a junk ball pitcher. I don't know what they call it. He was all off speed. And here comes Perry, who's, whether he's throwing Vaseline or not, he's throwing a, a, a hard pitch. Willie repositions the left fielder, who was Jim Ray Hart. And I can hear him either whistle to him or call to him. And I, because I never took my eyes off Willie. We was, my brother and I was sitting towards the outfield side of the infield. And Willie positioned Jim Ray Hart and Late in the game, the Mets put up a a strong left-handed batter, Larry Stahl. Stahl kept fouling the ball off. Willie kept moving Jim Ray Hart towards the foul line. And eventually, Larry Stahl hit a ball. From where we were sitting, Jim Ray Hart had his right foot on the foul line. That's how far Willie had pushed him over. Jim Ray caught the ball. If he didn't catch it, it would have killed him. It was right (laughs) at him. Willie had positioned him so well. And eventually the Giants won the game, and I'm pretty sure it was extra innings, and Jim Ray Hart hit the home run. Willie Mays, I, I never took my eyes off him. Yeah. Um, he, he, he showed something every single time I went to a game and I saw him. You wrote a great book. You've memorialized a great, not only a great ball player, but a great American. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Gary. Harvey, first of all, that was great. Second of all, the picture was sent. Jim can verify that. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, if, if, I, if I could say, if you look at that picture, Jim, you see Willie's hands signing the book, that those huge, beautiful hands. And the, then the cover, of the dust jacket of your book shows the same hands. That to me yeah. is magnificent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Magnificent. Thank you very much. All right. We're going to go to Jeff, then Steve, then Bill. Jeff, you're up. Thanks, Gary. Great presentation, Jim. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Uh, one thing also, I was at that game with Gary 50 years ago. We weren't together, but we, uh, <laughs> I was at the game. It was uh, uh, 50 years ago in about a week. So that was, uh, I, I remember Very it good. clearly. I was 10 years old. That was a great game. Uh, my question to you is, and you mentioned it early in, in your talk about Willie's mom, and you said she had 10 other siblings, 10 other children, which are Willie's half siblings. I'm always wondering, was he ever in touch with his half sibling siblings during his life? Uh, do you know anything about that? He, um, he, he was not. I, there were some sporadic connections there, but um, but nothing that was ever formed so, uh, in a permanent way. He, you know, when Willie became famous and affluent by the standards of 
Black Americans in the 1950s, I, I think some of those half siblings reached out to him. Um, but I um, really, really wasn't interested in forming any connections with them because the, he was really never part of that family. So there could be 10 people out there, one, <coughs> one relative of Willie Mays and uh, no connection to him. Wow, wow. I can understand that. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, Steve Rothschild. Just to, uh, to back up what Harvey said, we're kind of close in age and it's the same thing Harvey when I went to a game and Willie was playing, he just didn't take his eye off him. You know, kudos go to Gary for that uh, trophy signing that day, because if I remember correctly, and I couldn't make it, I live in Arizona now. I did make the second one. It was a private room for the New York Giants Preservation Society. And just to echo Gary's picture, mm -hmm. these are my grandsons yeah. getting that book signed by Willie Mays. They were, I guess, eight and five at the time. You know, I run a session out here in Sun City Grant Jim, you and I have spoken a couple of times. Um, I have a Zoom call scheduled tomorrow with Josh Tholey, thanks to Jeff Cohn, who was on previously. He's the guy that caught Johan Santana's no-hitter 2012. It was a big story up until last week because now there's a second no-hitter. I have Willie's number. I've called him on his birthday for the last 10 years. Last year was very difficult. His hearing was horrendous. But he gave basically gave the phone to Michael, which was good because I was able to say what I want. It's, it's your call. I, we did it last year. The group did it last year on a Zoom like this. We called him and we all sang happy birthday. And I could actually hear him laughing in the background. Is that something you would feel comfortable doing with us now? If not, not the end of the world. Uh, sure. And he, so, That's why I asked you before if you've spoken to him, because he'll know so, you. So I, I haven't spoken to Willie in a couple of years. Um, but I keep in regular touch with him through Renee. His but he generally ministry. picks up. When I call, he usually picks up. Yeah. Just happened to be lucky, maybe. Yeah. I don't know. Um, you. Yeah. And so I, um, but, but so, uh, you know, the, the last sort of interaction that I had with Willie indirectly was last year. And this kind of gives you a sense of our friendship. Um, can say our, our relationship. Our family was going to be in St. Louis last year for a, for a family visit, and the Giants were in St. Louis playing the Cardinals. And so I called Renee and asked if Willie could get us some some good tickets, you know, for the game. And of course, Willie did. And and so um, so that was like the last really you know, indirect interaction that I've had with him, <coughs> excuse me. But I mean, so my, my day tomorrow, and so you, you're gonna do a Zoom what I'm, call? No, what I'm saying is, and again, if, if it doesn't work, it's not the end of the world. We could do it towards the end of the session, but the gang would love to sing happy birthday to Willie Mays. So you could initiate the call, put it on speakerphone, if you get him on or if it's Renee or whatever, your call. I mean, I'm gonna do it tomorrow with my group out here. But this, oh, would give the, this we did it last year just like this and it was actually common yeah so i that's that wouldn't be something that i would do on my own okay that's um, fine and, and i guess i should really um you know clarify kind of my relationship with what you know i i didn't want to be his friend correct uh, i understand so that wasn't my objective um and so i i you know it's it's a professional relationship um, but, but just, but I think this is telling, um, when Willie's wife died, May, um, she died in 2012 or 2013, Willie asked me to give one of the eulogies and there were only three eulogists. There was, um, someone representing the San Francisco Giants. I think it was the, the owner, the guy. There was like a family friend and there was me. And I think Willie asked me because I, I know Willie's life better than anyone, I think. And as a result, I know May's life, Willie's relationship with May really well. And, and so I, my eulogy was about that. It was about how May fit in to Willie's life. And, um, and obviously I was honored to give a eulogy. Great honor. Uh, it was, and um, but I think that's kind of the 
relationship. You don't have to explain. There's a lot of people with questions. I just threw it out. Yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, but I just explain because sometimes people will say, oh, like, are you and Willie good friends? You're always talking. No, no, we're, we're not good friends. You know, we're, we, we have like a, a professional relationship. That's fine. No problem. Dave, when the session ends, if you want to call in, was that right? No, here? no, no. I'm going to wait till tomorrow. Okay. I don't want to overkill this. All right. Let's go to Bill Clay. Thank you very much, Jim. I read the book when it came out, and I guess I didn't pick up on a lot of the sociological impact of that. I think some of the stories that you told about the effects that he had on white culture in America, and uh, that, that, that I think is a tribute to Willie. Um, you mentioned, too, uh, the folks in, in Fairfield. I'll share with you a brief story and show you a picture. I took my son uh, back for a football game in 1997 in September. I insisted that we stop in Birmingham and we drove over to Fairfield, you know, and I, I had no idea where his home was. I had seen a picture and we tried to find the home and well, we couldn't find his home. So what's the next best thing? We went to the city hall and a lady at the city hall said, I don't know where Willie Mays lived, but the city councilman whose name doesn't ring a bell to me now, so he knows this guy drove in from wherever he was, met me at City Hall, said, follow me, drove me to Willie Mays' house, and I get a picture of, yeah. of me, and, you know, there's, there's me at Willie Mays' uh, door. I got the same thing with my son. But here's the thing. He get, well, you can't really see the letter, but he wrote down the name of the lady, lady who lived there <laughs> and her phone number and said, call her she'll <laughs> let you in and i said no uh I, no uh that, that's an invasion of privacy taking pictures in front of willie mays's boyhood put home is fine but i'm not calling some lady i don't know and asking to come in her house as a stranger but that was how friendly people were there yeah. was also a ballpark there willie mays field which right, we, right. you know we went to see and you've got you've been there and, and done that but um what a what a nice community that he grew up in. You could sense that it hadn't changed all that much. And yet, there's the Willie Mays. Uh, this, this was a, a 1983 uh, uh, Mercedes Benz that he had. <laughs> yeah. It's in front of the Crown Point Hotel in San Mateo. And yet, yeah, it, it is Say Hey 24 on it. So he, had, <laughs> he literally had everything 24. Here's one you guys haven't seen. That may be one of the earliest photos of him as a professional. Wow. That is Trenton, 1950, in front of what, what they called the bus. They, yeah. they traveled entirely by bus. Um, I, 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 I've met Willie a couple of times, but I will tell you, the, the photos, like that story in Fairfield and the people I got to know from the 50 Trenton uh, Giants teams gave me an appreciation of a man who... Uh, had an impact, a quiet, outside of the ballpark, a quiet impact on America, but he, but a large impact. Thank you for making an impact, Jim, with your book. It really was a wonderful one. You know, now I'm, what am I going to do now? I'm going to take it out of the garage and reread that thing again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Bill. We got uh, Paul and then somebody who has a hand up that just says iPhone. Don't know who that is. Paul, you're Mars. up. Mars. Hey, Mars. Paul, yeah, you're Jim, up. Thank, Jim, thank you so much. I really loved that book when it came out, and it's just really terrific. I have a, just my question is, in terms of um, Willie's closeness to his to his um, to his fellow ball players, which ball player on the New York Giants and the San Francisco Giants was Willie closest to, and why? Well, M Monty Irving was. Um, really kind of his his mentor when he when he joined um, in 1951 because obviously Monty is, was African American and was several years older so he really relied on Monty for guidance how to handle yourself both as a baseball player on the field and off the field um, with the San Francisco Giants oh gosh you know. Um, I would have to, um, who he was really close with. I, I can't really think of anyone who comes to my, 
to mind immediately. Um, you know, like he, he got along well with Cepeda and McCovey and, but he was, um, but I don't, I, I'm just thinking, I can't think of anyone top of my head. You know, he, he was older than a lot of the, 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 the younger players. So he kind of kept to himself. Um, I mean, I know I, I recall, you know, anecdotes in the book about how he would go to the, to the ballpark by himself and then he'd come home by himself. And, uh, and he, it was particularly before he got remarried, you know, he had a housekeeper who would cook him meals, but he, you know, he was always kind of a loner. Um, uh, so I, I, I don't recall off the top of my head who he was particularly close to on that Giants team. Okay, thanks, Jim. And we're gonna go to Mars and then Hindi. Uh, thank you, Jim, that was very informative. Uh, I want to ask you, uh, uh, I'm not sure if I have your book or not, because I have so many books on Willie Mays. The first one I bought was, I believe, written by Arnold Hanno, Born to Play Ball. It was uh, in the 1950s, and uh, I still have it. And actually, I got Willie Mays' autograph in the Polo Grounds after a game when I was eight years old in 1955, when all yeah. the fans were able to go out on the field after the game. So please tell me, I know you mentioned uh, you, uh, the book is about his childhood. How far do you take it into um, after that? You, you mean after he retires? Well, no, after his childhood, how far do you take Willie Mays' life up to about what age? Oh, well, I, his, his entire baseball career. And yeah, so it goes from, from birth to... Um, you know, he retires in 1973, and I write, you know, a little bit about his post-baseball life, um, you know, some of the, con the controversy he got in when he and Mickey Mantle were, you know, uh, uh, employed by the, by the casinos, um, but, but not a great deal, I mean, because he's, as, as mentioned, he's, he's had kind of a quiet post-baseball career, you know, he's, he's been a uh, an employee of the San Francisco Giants now for many years. He has some ambassadorial responsibilities, um, but but not not that much beyond his baseball. Career. Well, does does your book mention anything about? There was a period where Willie was a little bitter with the salary escalations, uh, and that he wasn't part of that. Do you mention any any anything about that in your book? You mean salary escalations after he retired? Yes. Um, I I don't mention no. I, I I was not aware that he was bitter about players getting too much money. Um, I, uh, I I would be a little bit surprised about that because he um, you know he. he he was he was always for players doing well. I mean, you know, that was his whole life, his his friendships with with fellow ball players. What what was interesting though to me was that Willie um, you know actually had mixed feelings about the end of the reserve clause, which um, which coincided with his retirement by by coincidence. In, in, in Willie's mind, he thought that, that the teams were responsible for taking care of the players. He had this very um, paternalistic sense of how teams should treat ball players and the idea that players should um, uh, uh, become free agents, play out, you know, exercise their option, go on to the market. I think that graded Willie. And maybe this is what you're referring to that really saw that as a sign of betrayal by the players. Um, now, now that you could easily criticize that view of Willie because while Willie was always treated well by his employer, whether it was the New York Giants, the San Francisco Giants or the Mets, many other players were treated like, you know, cattle, you know, when, when the teams were done with them, they would just discard that. Um, I think most of us welcome the fact that players won their autonomy by, by being able to 
you have to play on the on a team for what is it, five years, they had the option to go exercise their their um, their, their free agency and get paid uh, a lot of money. But you know, Willie was of a, of a different generation and thought that players should be loyal to to their employers. Well, it was the the owners are not loyal, but we used to have a saying, as uh, my friends and I were, many of them were Willie Mays fans like myself, we used to say if Willie played in today's game, they'd have to make him part owner. Because mm -hmm. he's right. worth so much more than anybody on the field today. <laughs> That's right. And you know what, if I, if I may interject one comment, which is, which is somewhat peripheral to, the, to what you just said, but but it brings to mind, if Willie Mays played today in the age of video social media, where it's all about finding the most exciting moment on the field and then sending it out on Instagram or, or um, you know, YouTube <laughs> or whatever, and that's where it's all about content. And that's where you make money. That's where the media outlets make money. That's where the teams make money. One of the really unfortunate things about Willie's career is that he played so many games that were not televised, that we, we have no film footage of it. Many of you on this call got to see Willie play in person. And that's, that's a blessing for, for you all. But for, for the, the rest of us, we just see Willie, you know, our, 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 our images of Willie are, are very limited. And it's unfortunate if he played today, he'd be a star you know, he, a transcendent star many times what he was when he played in his era. I was blessed that I was able to see him his whole career in the polo grounds. And then I moved to San Francisco in 1967. <laughs> so I'm <laughs> blessed with that. <laughs> very good. Thank, Thank you very you, much, Jim. Jim, this was my introduction to Willie Mays. It was, I was in uh, like fifth grade. I had this book by Howard Liss. Yeah. Somehow, somehow, maybe 15 years ago, I found it in a used store. Brought back great memories. Um, do you have time for a few more questions? Of course. Sure. Great. Um, Hindi, Mrs. Um, Willie Mays. You're I really loved your presentation. I just have a little memory about Willie Mays. <laughs> All right. I got this in 1962 when the Mets first started. Yeah. Okay. And then I went, and every year in Cooperstown, I would go and see him, and he would call me the button lady. And he would say, <laughs> oh, there comes the button lady again. So here's me and Willie. Oh, uh, that's magnificent. Oh, great. And he really was, he was wonderful. Very good. That's great to hear. Jim, I got a non-Willie Mays question. I have a Jim Hirsch question. Sure. Uh, your book on uh, Reuben Hurricane Carter. Yeah. Um, 1975, I was up in Monticello, New York, and my brother purchased the Bob Dylan album, Desire. And that was how I found out about him. I, oh, did yeah. have, I did not read your book. I'm sorry. I didn't even know much about it. Uh, what was your uh, feelings about the song? The song made Ruben not just a national figure, but an international figure. I, I met people, Gary, uh, uh, when, when I was doing the book and beyond, who knew about Ruben Carter. They lived their whole life in Germany or Australia, but they were Bob Dylan fans. <laughs> and, and through Dylan, people knew the story of the hurricane. Um, so it was, it, it, that was you know, an amazing, um, you know, chapter in Ruben's life, and and Dylan met Ruben when Ruben was in prison, and was persuaded of Ruben's innocence, and wrote the song, and Dylan was vindicated. You know, for a 14-year-old who didn't know anything, I knew every lyric of that song, and it was all the words. It was thought it was fabulous. Uh, I'm sorry, let's get back to Willie Mays. Andy, you're up. And Andy. Oh. Here I go. So, first of all, I read the book. I was lucky to be there. That first title, 10 into 11 from 10. Fantastic book, fantastic presentation. So many people that day talked of plays because a lot of these guys were lucky enough to see Willie play. 
the Bobby Morgan catch, for example, yeah. we didn't see, and all these famous plays. But Steve, get ready, because you mentioned a play Willie made, in, Willie made involving Wayne Garrett. You know, my mind, 73 World Series. Steve, you made a call to, I think, Yogi's daughter. Why don't you tell us what happened? And it amplify Willie, well, Wayne I, Garrett, I, why you I were bought, upset. I bought the recent Yogi bio. And I, too long a story, but Lindsay Berra and I know each other. I called her after I read the Yogi book, told her it was wonderful. And she said it wasn't. She went into a whole tirade. So I waited about a, a week or so. I called her back and I said, you know, I got a bone to pick with your grandfather. What are you talking about? I says, well, 1973, game seven. He's looking for a pinch hitter. There were two guys on the bench, Wayne Garrett and a gentleman named Willie Mays. Unfortunately, he picked the wrong one. <laughs> So that's the story that Andy, Andy's trying to share. Yeah. Thank you, Andy. Right. But thank you again. Great presentation. You link thank Willie you. and Wayne Garrett, among <laughs> other things. Thank um, you very much. Before we go to Greg Prince, Will Knox, do you want to say something? Will, you got to unmute if you want to tell your story. Will, you got to. You don't Hello, want to. Gary. Gary. Yeah, who's this? Rich Glazer. Hey, Rich, let's go to Greg Prince, and then Rich, you could ask your question. Greg, go ahead. Thanks, Gary. Thank you, Jim, for writing a terrific book that has stayed with me for the last now 12 years, I suppose. Uh, I learned from you tonight that I have something in common with Willie Mays. I was given the chance to choose my extension at a job I used to have. I chose 24 for my phone <laughs> number for the same reason Willie did. Uh, that's about as much as we have in common. Uh, I just wanted to, to ask you about one, one of the many nuggets that stays with me from your book was before Willie went into the army, you talked about his game at Ebbets Field, multiple standing ovations for a player from the Dodgers blood rival. Right. Uh, you know, just the, the, esteem that he was already held in one year into his career. I, I mean, obviously there are a lot of popular players out there who get standing ovations regardless of uniform. Uh, but that just blew my mind from a perspective of uh, the 2010s. I, I guess my question would be, was there anybody you know, putting, putting aside horrible racists, putting aside criticisms, was there anybody who didn't like Willie Mays? Did he have any you know, actual enemies is too strong a word, but were there people who just like kind of rolled their eyes at him during his career or did everybody kind of share that feeling of, you know, this, we are playing either with or against the greatest player there is and maybe who's ever been? Well, all the players admired and respected Willie Mays because they knew, you know, what, what a great player he was and he was a one of a kind player, but um, he, he was not beloved by many of the journalists and reporters who, who covered baseball, whether they were a, a beat reporter for the Giants or elsewhere, because Willie could definitely be difficult with reporters. He could be brusque and he could be um, hard to deal with uh, because I, I, I became more so as he got older, I think because he didn't trust people for some of the reasons I described earlier. So Willie did take his share of criticism from, from that cohort um, because he wouldn't give them the kind of access that, um, you know, that, that, that they were hoping for. Um, but in terms of people, in terms of other players and coaches, umpires, you know, Willie was not thrown out of a single game in his entire career. He, he never argued with umpires, which is reflective of his of how he was raised, you show deference to authority figures. Um, so in that sense, no, I mean, he was he was baseball royalty among his peers. Willie Mays was booed in Seal Stadium when the Giants moved here. And Herb Cain, the famous columnist, wrote, a city that cheers Nikita Khrushchev when Khrushchev was staying at the Mark Hopkins and booed Willie Mays. Plus, they wouldn't rent him a home in Miraloma Park. And I have that book. Uh, the the builder and the real estate broker wouldn't rent to him because he was right. black. 
Right. No, I, yeah, yeah. I, I had talked about that earlier. And, uh, and yeah, but it's a good point. Willie was not necessarily embraced immediately by San Francisco baseball fans because, and I mean, you all know the story. I won't belabor it, but, you know, Willie was seen as a New York baseball player and San Francisco fans wanted their own players. So they um, it gravitated towards Cepeda uh, and um, McCovey and some of the other, you know, really talented Marichal. young players, Marischal. And so it was definitely a transition, but I think after a few years, you know, that, that, um, uh, uh, you know, kind of difficultness, you know, went away and Willie was embraced and loved by San Francisco baseball. Fans. And some of us are pushing to have uh, Willie Mays field at Oracle park. Like they have Ricky Henderson field at the Oakland A's ballpark, but Larry bear, made a statement on our Zoom meeting, well, there are a lot, enough things already named after Willie Mays. To me, that was a slur. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go to Rich Glazer. Glazer. Uh, Rich, I'm sorry I mispronounced uh, it. Uh, yeah, I, uh, a couple of things. One, I think uh, Willie had a really good relationship with Bobby Bonds. And as a result oh, of the relationship he had with Bobby Bonds, when Barry Bonds was born, Willie was named his godfather. That's true. So I That's think that point. was the player who he might have been closest to. Uh, I had a personal uh, interaction with Willie. I was a uh, sports agent living uh, in uh, Long Island in, in the New York area. And I had a very good friendship with Ed Cranepool, who knew about my affection for Willie Mays. And uh, he brought me into the locker room clubhouse introduced me to Willie Mays and I spent quite a while sitting and talking to him. Uh, later on, a couple of years later, um, I went to a, um, a casino uh, in Atlantic City. I brought down a couple of NFL players to attend a Super Bowl party. Uh, and when I got there, the host of the party came over to me and said, I have somebody I want to introduce you to. And we started walking across the ballroom. He wouldn't tell me who he was going to introduce me to but I could see the direction we were heading. And I recognized that it, uh, that was Willie Mays. Didn't say anything to him that I already knew Willie Mays. So he taps Willie on the shoulder. Willie turns around and said, Richard. And he gives me this giant hug. The guy dropped dead. Mm. <laughs> Great story. Yeah. Thanks, Rich. Will Knox, you're up. OK, can you hear me now? Can you yes, hear me? You can. Okay, I went off my phone onto my computer, but I can't visually see, or you can't see me. But Jim, it's good to see you again, because yes. you and I interacted some years ago. I was a 10-year-old kid that Willie took to the ballpark because he lived four blocks from my house. Jim found out about that story. It's a fabulous story. It has basically stayed with me the rest of, your, rest of my life, because if you don't ask, you don't get. Uh, the essence of it was, as I hung and then I said to him, hey, Willie, how about uh, taking me and my friend Bobby to the game today? And he looks at me and he says, OK, jump in. So we hop into this 1961 Caddy convertible in San Francisco. No one has a convertible in San Francisco, I can assure you. <laughs> so we hop into the car and we're two blocks uh, out. Oh, my gosh, Willie, I forgot the tickets. We, we have our tickets. They're Bobby's house. Well, where's Bobby live? Bobby lives three blocks the other way. So we go, over, I'm making a really long story short. We go over, pick up Bobby's uh, uh, ticket. We pick up the tickets at Bobby's house and we get in the car and we're going. And all of a sudden I say, oh no, Willie, I forgot. My mom, she made my lunch today. And if I don't go <laughs> home and get my lunch, he's going to, she's going to kill me. Where do you live? Well, I live four blocks the other way. So there enough, sure enough, Willie just turns the car and pulls in front of my house and I run in the house and I go, mom, 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 Willie Mays is outside. He's taking me to the game, bye. And I <laughs> run, in, run into this car that my mom sees. I'm going into a car with an African-American and she's just beside herself, no doubt. And I go to the game and my brother who's 13 and his good friend, Doug, 
there and the seats uh, right behind the dugout that my aunt had given us. And, you know, I'm going at 10 years old, look who took me to the game. Willie Mays took me. Oh, you're full of crap. Well, <laughs> he'll take you home too, maybe. Cause Willie said to me and Bobby, who was, who my friend, as we got out of the car in the player's entrance, he says, you, you guys come back here after the game and I'll take you home. That's the heart of this guy. So I, I'm bragging to my brother. I'm saying, well, maybe he'll take you home too. So sure enough, after the game, we gather at the player's entrance. And of course, it's just a mob scene. And Willie sees me and he says, get in the car, get in the car. <laughs> and I say to my, my brother and his friend, you guys stay low, go in the back seat, go in the back seat. He won't even know you're there. So we come out of the candlestick parking lot and he turns around and goes, who the hell is this? <laughs> these, are my, these are my brothers, Willie. You, you don't mind taking them home, do you? And, and he's, he's cornered. He goes, let's go. So two weeks later, a friend of mine was over at my house. And we had sleepovers in those days. And he couldn't believe the story. And we had tickets to the game. And I said to him, you don't believe the story? Let's go back up to Willie's house. So we go up to Willie's house. And we hang out there waiting for Willie to come out. He sees me and he takes one look at me and he says, get in the car. So he took me to the ballpark twice. And it was a really wonderful love story. And he's, he is the idol of my life and has been since I was 10 years old. I'm now 71. And thanks to Jim Hirsch, that story has been immortalized. And I told Jim when he wanted to use the story, no problem, but I'm going to try to use this book as the backdrop to produce the life story on Willie Mays, which I'd like to do and I've wanted to do. And Willie's been very resistant. As Jim said, he's not, he's not good in any kind of public eye and has rejected wanting to do his life story on film while he is still alive because his main contention has been, you guys who produce these films, you never throw in the dialogue the way we really lived it. So I don't want to know about it. Does that sound like Willie, Jim? Yeah, that sounds like Willie. Well, there's a documentary coming out by Nelson George and, and Sean Stewart. And it's supposed to come out around World Series time on Willie Mays. And actually, Gary put me in touch with Nelson George. So they interviewed me at the hotel across the street from the Giants Park. And Nelson texted me. He says this should be out around uh, the World Series. Because after all, it's the Willie Mays trophy. Well, I can tell you that he was certainly open to the idea of a documentary, but he was not open to a narrative of, of that, of a story. Oh, I see. We would uh -huh. embellish and we had a really good team assembled, but uh, I'm not going to give up on it because I didn't give up on asking Willie for a ride to the ballpark. <laughs> and I'm not giving up on having the, the field at, at Snor Snorkel Park. I call it snorkel because they're not hitting. Uh, <laughs> I'm not giving up on Willie Mays Field at Oracle Park. Thank you. Jim, I'm going to wrap this up. Um, uh, I think in 2012, they had uh, New York Giants night at a at AT T Park. And we were fortunate enough to be on the field. And, you know, I became a Giant fan because my dad – uh, loved the New York Giants, and he loved Willie Mays, and I'm sure that's the reason why he continued liking the San Francisco Giants. So anyway, we're out on the field that day we're being honored, and then we're, we're walked off the field, and we follow Peter McGowan, and we get to the clubhouse, and lo and behold, Willie Mays is there to sign balls for me. And my only thought that went through my head was how the hell am I sitting here with this guy who my dad immortalized and my dad should have been there in my place. But uh, unfortunately he, you know, my, my dad passed in 2003. He didn't get to see that, but we cannot thank you enough for giving us all your time tonight. Um, and you guys know that if you, the book is not new, but it's so fabulous. If you haven't gotten yet, Jim said the best way is to, uh, Get it through Amazon. I will forward that um, when I send out the link to this uh, video. I will again send out the link to uh, Jim's fabulous book. Jim, we cannot thank you enough. Let's all give it up for Jim Hirsch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.